This is a real um, important panel, and I'm, I'm really pleased to have with us uh, our first presenter. Today will be um, Trent Briggs, who, Biggs, who is the professor of geography here, um, who is busy using satellite imagery and field work and, and done a lot of work and research in the Tijuana River watershed um, and, and is looking with his students at, at um, urbanization and environmental consequences of that urbanization on our border. And we'll get to our presenters. Dr. Biggs, you're up. Great, thanks, um, thanks for those introductions. And uh, thanks to Paul for inviting me to talk. Of the 120 years of experience up here, I have about 12 of those. <laughs> so I'm kind of the new kid on the block or new kid on the border or whatever, however you would interpret that. Um, and so I entered this, uh, I answer, uh, um, agreed to talk with a little bit of trepidation since, um, since there's people here in the room and on the, st on the stage who have uh, a lot more experience than I do. So um, any errors of omission or otherwise, uh, please forgive those. Um, so I'm going to be talking about the history of collaborative research and data integration for the Tijuana River watershed. I'm going to be asking three questions. What's the history of cross-border research in water at SDSU? Uh, what are the policy-relevant conclusions that have come out of that work? And uh, what are the challenges and opportunities for the future? Okay, so um, as has been pointed out, the Tijuana River watershed crosses the border. It's about a third in uh, the United States, about a third in Mexico. Uh, and that includes both the large main stem of the Tijuana River, as well as three small side canyons that drain directly to the Tijuana estuary and then ultimately to the, to the ocean. But starting in the 1930s, a series of dams were constructed, and so the effective contributing area is actually much smaller, that sort of peach area. And so the upper part of the watershed is hydraulically and um, uh, is hydraulically separated from the rest of the watershed. And so really, when you're talking about controlling or addressing uh, water and pollution problems, you're really talking about that much smaller peach area that is really both sides, uh, is really about half and half on the U.S. and half, uh, half in Mexico. Okay, um, so the SD SDSU has institutions and research programs that have sponsored work uh, on the Tijuana River watershed and I'd like to call out Paul uh, Ganster in particular for uh, founding the IRSC, Institute for the Regional Studies of the Californias, in the mid to late 80s. And that um, institute has been fundamental in sponsoring a lot of the research I'm gonna be talking about. Um, in particular, he's been talking about, he and uh, Kim Collins, who's also here, have been talking about the notion of twinning, which is an integrated approach to cooperation across the international border, including joint planning, shared infrastructure, and economic integration. And so I'll be asking throughout this um, presentation or reflecting on how close are we to twinning in both research and uh, planning. Okay, so one of the first successes of the IRSC was to um, collaborate with the EPA to create the Southwest Consortium for Environmental Research and Policy, or SCRP. Uh, and that was a 13-year program, and I, uh, Rick Van uh, Schoik, who also was, was here this morning, I'm not sure if he's here right now. Um, yeah, so, uh, so he ran that program for a good 13 years. It sponsored dozens of studies, including those on water. And it included a, 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 a number of, inst uh, of universities on both sides of the border. So out of the SERP program came, uh, you know, both seed and substantive money for 30 years of collaborative research. And I'm going to be talking about three areas in particular that SDSU has been involved in, water quality, flooding and erosion, which we haven't really talked about, but is actually an issue that more, uh, even more directly kills people. Uh, than water quality issues and uh, data integration. Okay, so in terms of water quality, again, starting with Paul's work uh, convening uh, seminal workshops starting in 19, 1988, water quality issues of the border region, specifically the San Diego Tijuana border and brought environmental issues more broadly. It involved an impressive aware array of university, government, and NGO actors, including the uh, International Boundary Water Commission, the State Water Board, 
uh, universities, Carlos uh, de la Parra was there. Um, and they focused a lot on issues of governance and uh, wastewater and reclamation. Some of the same issues we're actually still talking about uh, today. So one of the policy relevant conclusions that came out of that series of workshops were that US resources, financial resources in particular, are better spent for infrastructure projects in Mexico than on infrastructure projects in the United States. So you get more bang for your buck in terms of addressing water quality and pollution problems by using US resources to address problems directly in Mexico. And secondly was that universities ended up being key to convening researchers and uh, decision makers in sort of a neutral forum. Um, so then um, with CERP money, uh, Rick Gersberg, uh, addressed issues of toxins and bacteria and runoff, uh, particularly in the Tijuana River watershed. And um, his policy relevant conclusion was that storm flows were the biggest problem, especially the first flush. Um, but storm flows are hard to measure, they're difficult to monitor. My sort of Murphy's law of storm flow is that it's gonna rain on Christmas and New Year's, and it looks like this year now I have to add Thanksgiving <laughs> when the students aren't around to sample, and so they're incredibly difficult uh, events to, uh, to actually successfully monitor. Um, he also found that the heavy metal loads across the border were not that significantly different from other urbanized watersheds in, in uh, the San Diego region, and that was, uh, uh, I thought, a very interesting conclusion that it may not be as bad as even our own uh, other urban areas. Um, he also concluded that expanding sewage collection in Tijuana is the critical uh, problem. He's also been working on uh, bacteria and drinking water, particularly in indigenous communities on the border. That work has been since been taken up by other researchers, Kerry Sant, uh, uh, Yun Ha Ho in public health, and Natalie Bonadov in uh, civil engineering. And they are um, monitoring bacterial contamination in the Tijuana River uh, and in the side canyons and trying to identify hotspots. Um, so in the terms of data integration, Richard Wright really led the charge on that. And uh, I divided this into a couple eras. One was 1970s to 1990s when uh, Richard uh, put in what he calls windshield time, which is trust building and individual uh, data agreements with uh, institutions and uh, universities that culminated in, or one of the culminations of that was uh, when NOAA f took aerial photos of the entire Tijuana River watershed, which was a complex undertaking, undertaking uh, because it involved flying a surveillance plane over, uh, over an international border. And that ended up resulting in the Tijuana River being selected as a national community demonstration site. And uh, who's that handsome guy? That's Al Gore uh, back in 1998 when he was vice president. And um, he led a national spatial data infrastructure project. And the Tijuana River watershed was selected as one of a handful of demonstration uh, community projects in the nation. And so that um, funding and interest culminated in the Tijuana, Tijuana River Watershed Atlas, which is a harmonized cross-border atlas that includes all kinds of environmental data, including geology, soils, uh, rainfall patterns, uh, population, roads, uh, vegetation communities, land use, um, et cetera. And um, as, as Richard has, has uh, made clear, and as from reading the reports has made clear, it was an extremely complex undertaking to harmonize cross-border data sets so that we could um, adequately model the hydrology and address some, uh, some critical um, uh, research questions that are policy relevant as well. Um, so in terms of flooding and erosion, there has been a significant amount of accumulation of sediment in the Tijuana estuary, and the red is between eight and 15 feet of sediment accumulation, and that buries um, native salt marsh communities and uh, replaces them with upland vegetation. And so you can see that the, the side canyons are very important for that uh, high load and high accumulation rates of, of sediment. And so one of the critical questions was um, where is uh, sediment coming from? What's its relation to socioeconomic status? 
and can we both help residents and reduce erosion at the same time? Um, and um, this, uh, that question led to, that set of questions led to a series of projects, first funded by SERP and then by the EPA with uh, Doug Leiden's help, who's, Doug's in the audience, um, as well as researchers from uh, COLEF and CESESE and two PhD students, one of whom was co-advised between me and Tomas Kreshmar at uh, CESESE. Um, and that was a, a nine-year project. And one of the first things that we learned is that the poor are the ones who live in areas with high erosion rates. Um, so uh, on the right is a, a map of what's called the socioeconomic marginality index. And so the higher the marginality, the poorer the community in terms of infant mortality, in terms of piped water supply or lack thereof, uh, whether they have drainage, et cetera. And so the poor periphery is the place where there's persistent soil exposure, there's high slopes, there's uh, rapid erosion rates. And they're exposed, exposed to all kinds of hazards, including landslides and flooding. Um, so we ended up concluding that one of the critical things we can do to control erosion is to identify co-benefits, projects that have co-benefits that both reduce loading of sediment and pollution, but also improve the lives of residents. So this is a picture of a, um, a rapidly eroding stream channel in the Los Lorales or Goat Canyon, um, and it shows the damage to some of the infrastructure. The, um, the residents then have to compensate by that to, for that stream uh, channel erosion by adding additional sediment um, that then gets wiped out by the next storm. And so they're sort of in a desperate struggle with the erosional processes to save their property um, from, from destruction. Um, another co-benefit is uh, road stabilization. So unstable roads and erosion on roads is a significant source of sediment. Um, here we are in the field measuring the, 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 um, the geometric um, or the, the size and width, basically, of these erosional features. And um, the residents, we also did a survey where the residents ranked erosion of the roads as one of the, their primary compromise, one of the primary factors that compromise their quality of life. Um, because after it rains, uh, gullies can open up. Some of them are gigantic. Here's one that was up to about six meters deep. Um, and you can imagine that that interrupts their transportation. It also interrupts their water supply. And these are already poor communities, sort of on the edge of uh, sort of socioeconomic viability. Um, and so we think that there are real opportunities for win-win solutions that can, uh, that can help solve the problem. And that's documented in a series of, of articles. And Napoleon uh, Godinho Elizondo is actually here today who did a lot of this work, including on this uh, particular gully. Um, so one of the potential problems with stabilizing roads and paving them is that you can get flooding, particularly at the downstream end. Here's a picture of the border, and I have an error where it says three small holes, and the, um, the border looks like a gigantic dam, which it would be if but for three holes that are literally about three feet wide and that fill up about halfway with sediment, about halfway through the season. And so uh, during big floods, that whole place can fill up like one gigantic uh, reservoir. Um, and last year, uh, one, at least one person died in the, in the flooding uh, in the canyon, and I'm sure that there are others that were not adequately documented. Um, so that's going to be one critical water-related hazard that we have our eyes on, as well as the, the wastewater problem that's created in part by the border itself. Um, so Mexico has been um, uh, actively involved in trying to reduce sediment loads, much to, much to their credit. There are now 50 to 60 sediment retention basins like this one scattered throughout Tijuana, and this is one of the more recent ones that was installed in Los Lorelles uh, Canyon. And they cost many millions of dollars to create and install and maintain. Um, and one of the conclusions from, from the research that we've done at SDSU is that controlling the source of the sediment, 
through projects that also improve the lives of residents is most likely going to, um, going to be the, the most cost effective. So moving forward, I think we have some opportunities to leverage new technologies to foster twinning. Um, one is uh, new web tools for regional data sharing, and especially geo portals. And this is a project that was brought to my attention very recently uh, by Daniela Bram at uh, CSUN, or CSU Northridge, a, sis a sister um, CSU campus, where they're trying to um, gather all the geospatial data along the border, sort of like doing a Tijuana River watershed atlas for the whole border. Um, and make that data available online for anyone to download. Um, and I think that would represent a significant advance in our, in our ability to synthesize and share, share data. Um, the other, uh, another significant advance is uh, the sharing of real-time information. Uh, this is an example of, the, of uh, stream flow data that's um, measured in Mexico but reported on websites. Uh, including in the United States, maintained by the San Diego uh, County Flood Control District. And San, Di San Diego State is also working on real-time sensors that uh, upload data on water quality to the web in real time. And, uh, and I think one vision for the future is that we have real-time monitoring of all the flows that, that, are, that are crossing the border and their, their quality in ways that you could look up on your, on your cell phone. That tells me I have four minutes left. Um, so, um, so I think that's one critical area that we have to work on is real-time um, data sharing. And finally, I think in the, in, the, in the sort of mid to long term, I think it's critical that we look at moving from just online data to online modeling and simulation. This is an example of what's called my, Model My Watershed, and it's uh, a platform that allows students, government agencies, um, regulatory bodies to carry out simulations of their own that uh, could include land use change, uh, new dams, new uh, low impact development, and, um, and I think is really kind of the, the way we need to think about um, transitioning and, and to sort of a web-based uh, model and simulation uh, for enhancing cross-border dialogue. And you'll notice from the snapshot that, of course, the whole simulation capability of this system stops at the border and doesn't include the Tijuana River watershed. So I think that's a, a, an area where collaboration could be enhanced. Other priorities that SDSU hasn't been as involved with uh, is drinking water distribution. And um, here uh, is a screenshot of Paul Ganster that I saw on Friday giving an interview on KBBS about the intermittent water shutoffs uh, in uh, Tijuana. And, um, and I think there's still significant work to be done on, on that. So um, another institution that's come on, uh, into existence, born in 2015, that's what the B2015 means, uh, is the Blue Gold Area of Excellence, within, which includes 13 faculty from four different departments. Um, and we have a bunch of complementary expertise on groundwater simulation, bacteria monitoring, contaminants of emerging concern, um, uh, wastewater recovery, advanced wastewater treatment techniques. And so, uh, so we look forward to, uh, to collaborating uh, with other centers on both in the US and, uh, and in Mexico. Um, so I think challenges and opportunities for the future include, um, can research, uh, and particularly research done through collaboration with universities, contribute to this twinning process in water resource problem identification and solutions-oriented research? Um, how can we institutionalize cooperation for joint projects and data sharing? So it doesn't have to be through uh, sort of one-off uh, data agreements that, that take um, a lot of windshield time as using uh, Richard Wright's uh, terminology. Um, and finally, what are the most critical water problems that can be solved with further research? Where are the significant knowledge gaps? And so I look forward to uh, further conversation with you and uh, hope that we can uh, together contribute to further twinning of our uh, beloved border region. So thanks very much.